In the movie, Back to the Future 2, there is a scene where one of the characters, Doc Brown, opens up a briefcase full of money specific to different time periods. Turns out, I have the same thing. Except mine is full of electrolytic capacitors. This capacitor type has a known operational lifetime, and at some point they will fail and need to be replaced. So whether you're repairing a decades old computer or just had one fail in something newer, there are always a ton of options when it comes to selecting a replacement cap. My name is James and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. As many of you know, capacitors are one of my favorite topics. In this video, I explain why aluminum electrolytic capacitors need replacing in the first place. Then I take you through the decision tree I use when selecting replacements. I also pull out caps from an example device. And finally, I walk through all of those steps for selecting their replacements from a distributor's website. Heads up, in this video, I cover radial lead aluminum electrolytics that you find in electronics like computers, power supplies, and audio equipment. I am not covering the large cans that you might find in a home appliance. Also, I'm focused on repair and not new design. Now, most of the things I cover will apply to both with the exception of cost. With that, let's go select. I could spend several videos talking about how aluminum electrolytics are made and why they fail, but this video is about picking their replacements. So let's just take a brief look at a simplified cross section so we have a good starting point. The anode is a sheet of ultra pure aluminum with an oxide layer grown on it. That oxide is the dielectric and its thickness is determined by the rated voltage. A lead or terminal is attached to the anode, but the dielectric is too thin and fragile to connect one to it. So another sheet of aluminum is used with a lead attached to that. But if sandwiched together, the dielectric would get damaged and shorts would occur. So a piece of craft paper sits between them. But now there's no electrical contact between the dielectric's cathode and the cathode terminal. To solve that, an electrolyte soaked into the paper provides an electrical path. That electrolyte is ionic, conductive, and slightly acidic, which is important because over time, the acid breaks down the oxide layer. However, when voltage is applied, like turning on the device, the oxide regrows by taking oxygen out of the electrolyte. When that happens, hydrogen gas is released. As the electrolyte loses the oxygen and hydrogen, it dries out and becomes less conductive, causing its ESR to go up. Also, the dielectric layer can no longer reform or heal itself. So the main wear out mechanism for an electrolytic capacitor is that it dries out. Now, there is a rubber gasket that keeps air out but allows the hydrogen to escape. If that gasket fails, the electrolyte can leak out. And if that leaking occurs, it will damage the PCB and other components. The electrolyte drying out or the seal failing is why electrolytic capacitors need to be replaced eventually. Which means even if an electrolytic isn't bulged or showing signs of leaking, it may still need to be replaced. Okay, next, let's go through the steps that I use when picking a replacement capacitor. First, I select the same capacitance value even though the value is rarely critical, especially if it's a decade value like 10, 100, or 1000. Going up one step in the E12 series may give you additional options. For example, look for 120 microfarads instead of just 100 microfarads. Then for voltage, I look for something rated at least the same or slightly higher. The higher the rate of voltage, the thicker the initial dielectric is, which can give it a slightly longer operational life. Next is diameter length or bolt. The mechanical design of the device under repair determines these constraints. You should also consider pitch or distance of the terminals, especially if replacing a snap-in or screw terminal. If the capacitors you are replacing are more than 10 years old, new equivalents are probably smaller than the originals. For that reason, I tend to look for higher voltage and temperature ratings to match something of the same physical size. Speaking of temperature, the rated temperature and operational life are interrelated. Electrolytics have specs like 1000 hours at 85 degrees C. Now replacing an 85C with 105C and 105C with 125C is pretty easy, but the lifetime is rarely printed on a cap. So I always look for the highest lifetime rating that I can find. Some people are already freaked out because they see 1000 hours, which is only like a month. However, that time is at the full rated temperature and usually the full rated voltage. Operating at a lower temperature means the capacitor is derated, which increases the life. 
Now, the magic guideline is that you double or half the life of the capacitor every time you change the temperature by 10 degrees. For example, if you're operating a 1000 hour cap rated for 85C, but the ambient is only 55 degrees, it is now an 8000 hour rating. And if it is rated for 50 volts, but you only ever apply five, guess what? You get to double the lifetime some more. Turns out voltage derating isn't as clean as the temperature. After about 30%, the life stops doubling. So in this example, we get somewhere around 30,000 hours, which works out to be about four years, which might seem short, but keep two things in mind. The actual operational life is probably longer, and this is just another reason why we need to replace the aluminum electrolytics eventually. Next is ripple current and or impedance, which are related. Higher impedance means less ripple current handling because ripple current causes the capacitor to self-heat. Now here's the problem. Unless you can find period specific data sheets for the capacitors that you are replacing, you will have very little idea about their original impedance. Even if the series has been around for decades, the series has probably changed over time. Also, this information isn't always easy to compare, even on new parts. For example, comparing these on a distributor's website doesn't show us much. We would have to go into the individual data sheets to compare. However, in general, if it is roughly the same physical size, the impedance will probably be similar, and for most cases, it'll be close enough. Besides, at this point, you're probably doing more research than the original designers did. The last consideration is cost. When doing a new design, all of these effectors can increase or affect the cost. But for repair, the difference is usually minimal, so I just pick the better spec throughout the tree. Of course, are any of these a hard rule? Probably not. Maybe capacitance. But that's the tree that I follow. Now in the show notes over on the Element 14 community, I've added an image of that table that you can download. Okay, enough of the graphics. Let's get the soldering iron out. The TRS-80 Model 100 is a portable computer released in 1983. It was extremely popular with writers even into the late 1990s because of its excellent keyboard and long battery life on four AA batteries. Like most portable devices from the 1980s and 90s, its smaller electrolytic capacitors have leaked. In general, the smaller the can, the more aggressive the electrolyte, and the more likely that the seal fails. Initially, I thought this board was fine, but as I started removing these smaller electrolytics, I saw the extremely obvious signs of leakage, corrosion, and damage. Remember, just because you don't see bulging or PCB damage, it does not mean it is not there. For example, I hit the solder joints on this cap and lifted it up just a little bit, and here you can see the corrosion. But when the cap was in place, that was hidden. By the way, I did live stream the removal of all of the caps. If you would like to see that video, there is a link in the show notes. In total, I removed 17 capacitors from this Model 100. Once out, I measured the diameter and length of each capacitor. I added that detail to a spreadsheet that I created to keep track of the designators, values, and eventually their replacements. One thing I forgot to measure was the pitch, but it turns out in this case, by keeping the diameters of the replacements the same, their pitches were the same. Now, before we look at the replacements, check out these caps. None of them have a cathode marker and that's because they are non-polarized or bipolar electrolytic capacitors. They don't have an anode or cathode terminal. It turns out if you put two polarized capacitors in series, they can tolerate both positive and negative voltages. So these capacitors have a special foil which is split, effectively creating two capacitors in series after it gets rolled up. Okay, now that I've got a pile of example caps, let's go talk about how to choose the replacements. For this video, I did something a little bit different. I went to my office and I recorded myself using the Newark website, for obvious reasons, while I picked the replacement capacitors. Now, the whole process ended up taking like 30 minutes, which I won't subject you to that here. Instead, let's take a look at a couple of clips. So let's turn it over to the mini bald engineer. Now I need a in stock, one farad, one microfarad, and 50 volt. So we'll do 50 and 63. So I do the one step higher because when you do the sort, sometimes prices on the caps might actually be cheaper or there could be a special where the distributor is trying to get rid of a certain value. And so it's counterintuitive because you typically want to think, oh, higher rate, it must mean it's going to be more expensive part. But sometimes you might end up with something slightly lower. Okay, so I'm doing one mic, 50 volt, 4.7. So we better select this one. Uh, let's see, 1,000 hours at 105. Okay, so let's select the 105C. That gets us down to four parts. Let's just see what we get. Compare. These are all in stock. 
They're all about the same price, so this is going to be an interesting choice. Um, so 1,000 hours, 1,000 hours, 1,000 hours, 3,000 hours. And it's a, roughly the same price, right? Okay. Uh, so this is our winner at the moment. Uh, length is shorter than some of the others. The correct diameter. I think that's going to be our winner. It's rated for a longer life. Uh, so, hmm. And it's not much more expensive than everyone else. In this next one, I point out my earlier comment about ripple current and I focus on the lifetime values. So now I'm going to pay closer attention to some of these other things. So you'll notice almost none of these caps that we look at in this exercise will list their ESR. Some will list their ripple current, but in general for these smaller caps, they just, the data is not available. What I'm really interested in now is if I look at the lifetime, we already selected 105C. And if I look at this, we can see one cap is rated for 5,000 hours at 105C, which sounds really good to me. The rest of this stuff is gonna be about the same, I bet. So four millimeter, ooh, I selected a five by accident. Uh, 35 volt when we only need 16. And if let's just go double check the price on this one. It's 17 cents. This is a winner. Last, here's what happened when I got a little bit filter happy while finding the bipolars. Now I want to do the non-polarized capacitors, which are still in the leaded aluminum electrolytics. The only thing we have to make sure we select is the non-polar filter option. So let's see, one microfarad, 50 to 63 volts, we might as well. Radial lead it. Uh, I'm going to, uh-oh, bomb, bomb. We already don't have it available. Here's the thing. I found this capacitor earlier. Tell you what, let's do in stock and start with bipolar. And maybe now we'll be able to select from some of the options to see which one we want. Um, one microfarad, and that brings us down to five possible parts. Okay, and radial lead it, four parts. Okay, we're down to four parts, let's just compare these. I'm not sure why this didn't work before, but this is a good lesson. Just do your search over. <laughs> Start with the most critical aspect first, which in this case is non-polarized. Okay, so 2000 hours, 85C, all the same. They're all bipolar. This one doesn't have a height, which is bad news because I don't like when that's missing. And then let's see, this is 100 volts versus 16 and 35. That's suspicious. We need something rated for 50 volts. So this looks like our only option. Okay, overall, if you follow the chart, it's pretty easy to pick replacement electrolytics. By the way, if you would like to watch the mostly unedited version of that session for some reason, it is available on the Element 14 community. After receiving the replacements, I labeled each bag with their values and capacitor position to speed up the recap process. Then I replaced them all with little trouble. In fact, it was just fun times with the soldering iron. After I was finished, I powered up the Model 100 and wrote my usual basic test program. Before closing, let's cover a couple more things. Aluminum polymers replace the electrolyte with a solid polymer material called P-DOT. It gives them a much lower ESR. They still wear out, but for a different reason. The polymer oxidizes over time. These tend to be more expensive, and there are fewer case, voltage, and capacitance combinations available. For more information, check the show notes for a pair of the Learning Circuit episodes that I did on these. Axial capacitors are becoming harder to find. So I designed an axial adapter, which fits VIC-20s and Commodore 64s. It adapts 10 millimeter surface mounts to an axial footprint. I call it the BAC adapter. I'll let you figure out that acronym. Last, sometimes you can replace electrolytics with ceramics or surface mount polymer tantalums. However, those tend to be special cases, like when recapping a game gear, but that's a topic for another video. Remember, the best place to ask me questions, especially capacitor questions, is on the Element 14 community. Over there, I am more likely to see and then be able to answer them. As always, thank you for watching. For now, it is time for me to get back to methodically replacing ionically depleted aluminum electrolytic capacitors on my electronics workbench.